talk uh, about agile versus waterfall software development, uh, or how the IT industry grew up. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, the, the briefly about the history of uh, IT and how we eventually developed uh, you know, the waterfall methodology, and then how we've now moved on to look at agile and how that. Uh, in my opinion, you know, is a vast improvement over waterfall. Uh, so let's think about the software industry. Uh, we're really quite a new industry. I mean, you know, we've we've all worked in it for a few years, but uh, in reality, you know, it's only been mentoring for 20, 30 years. You know, when you compare that with uh, other professions, you know, banking, legal. Um, construction, etc. You know, we haven't really got a lot of history. You know, we haven't really had a lot of time to develop. You know, what are you know the best ways to do things? So we're still learning, we're still evolving uh, our best practices. There's a bunch of successes that everyone's heard of, like people like Google, Facebook, etc. Um, but there are quite a few failures as well. So. Um, People have had problems with their debit cards, not being able to get money out of uh, cash machines. The air traffic control system had some problems, and the CSA, for example, uh, have all had lots of problems. Uh, we've all heard about government uh, IT projects overrunning, costing a lot more, not delivering what people want. So there are a lot of failures in projects in, in IT. Uh, and so what I'm going to look at today is some of the reasons for those uh, if they're using the waterfall methodology and how agile can improve that or can mitigate some of those problems. So when we first started uh, it was a bit of a wild west culture um, you know computers were new we we're still learning what we could do with them etc there's a bit of a frontier spirit about it all um, the projects that we built were generally small scale um, we uh, you know, had very little methodology or rigour to them. You know, so this was in the really early days where people were, were just trying to work out what, you know, what could we use these wonderful new machines called computers for. Um, and really it was more of a craft than an industry. So um, you know, people you know, were very talented, the people were attracted to it, and they were spending you know, doing small scale projects that were uh, often, you know, one-offs. Um, they weren't really, you know, thinking about it as a uh, profession. They were just trying to solve the problems that they were looking at today for the time that they they needed, um, and that often meant that they were actually quite hard to maintain as well. So, yes, we got the industry off off and running, but you know, we saw there were lots of problems with having no real process around how we would build software. So what did we do? We uh, decided to go and search around and find out a better methodology. What process could we put around the process of writing software? And uh, a lot of people in the IT industry had you know, an affinity with engineering. You know, so people would typically Maybe they'd been tinkering at home, maybe they'd built computers themselves, maybe they uh, had done engineering degrees. Um, so we saw that uh, you know, civil engineering, etc., they had a process, seemed to work, it delivered um, you know, projects for them. So we decided to apply that to software, see if we could improve on those ad hoc um, uh, processes that we were using before. So, what would we do? Well, you know, we'd specify the requirements of our project, we'd go and gather them uh, at the beginning, like you would if you were going to build a bridge, you'd want to know where you wanted it to go from and to, how much weight it needed to carry, you know, what the conditions were of the environment it was going to be in. We'd get an architect, um, so, you know, we decided that in software, well, we could have this model of an architect who would design the overall solution, etc. Uh, we'd have a project manager who would put together a plan. We do that in industry, in, in engineering. They, they build a plan of, you know, well, we've got to put foundations in first, and then we're going to build the wall, and then we're going to put 
roof on, etc. Uh, once we've got the uh, overview of the software from the architect, the actual individual developers need to design their little bits. Um, then they go away and build it. Uh, they do the complete software build, and then at the end you test that it actually meets your requirements. Um, and finally, you hand it over to a customer at delivery. So that's the sort of practices that we thought, well, they, they sound pretty good, they work quite well in, in engineering, let's, let's try and adopt them. So let's have a look at the traditional process, the waterfall process. Uh, we have a plan about how we'll do things, we'll do the activities in a particular order, we'll specify up front, then we'll do a bit of architecting, then we'll do a bit of design, then we'll build it, we'll do the quality assurance, and then finally deliver it. That's all underpinned by uh, plan. <coughs> and that's why we call it waterfall, because it's a cascade down the timeline uh, to give us uh, what looked a little bit like a waterfall. Um, so let's look at these individual steps uh, of the process and, and, and see how they work. Um, you know, why we pick them up and, and, and what they're there for. So, let's start at the beginning. We capture requirements. This is a job typically done by a business analyst. Uh, their role is to work with the customer, they're the primary contact of that customer. Um, they go through, they actually collect those customers' requirements, uh, they document them, uh, they do some analysis of the business processes, uh, and then finally, they sit down and they write what's called a functional specification, uh, which defines everything that the customer needs um, uh, and what the architects and the software developers are going to build. Uh, and then at that point, they can say, right, my job is done, and they can hand over the specification to the developers. And in the recent uh, uh, years, we've seen increasingly that being handed over to the development team in an offshore environment. So India or China, for example, doesn't have to be, um, but you know, we've, we've been seeing that recently. So after that, obviously we need to plan the project. Well, we've actually started planning before that, but um, you know, let's look at what you know, happens during that project planning uh, process. Well, we break down the project into a bunch of tasks. Now, if you're building a bridge, you probably know exactly what tasks you're going to do, as far as if we talk about foundations, putting in the um, supports, building the roadway, perhaps, those sorts of things. Um, we then estimate them. Uh, in IT, in software projects, the set of tasks that we need to do, we don't necessarily know up front. We can have a reasonable guess, um, but it's not quite the same as in a civil engineering project, because every project is slightly different. Uh, but we'll sit down, we'll take those tasks and we'll estimate them, uh, which will give us an idea of, sort of how much effort is required to deliver the whole project. Uh, then we'll actually sit down and we'll create a plan. Um, and I'll show you what a plan looks like in a few minutes. In fact, we've just seen that waterfall thing, which is sort of a high-level plan. Uh, which will give us uh, you know, an, a view of uh, what's required to deliver the project. We'll then allocate resources, i.e. people, uh, to, the, to the plan so we can work out, you know, person A, well, they can only work 40 hours a week, so obviously if we give them these tasks, they have to fit them in, so we can then level working out how much effort is required by what people, when, to produce uh, an end date, um, which will tell us you know, when we can hand it over to the customer at the end. Typical World War projects, anything from six months to three years or longer, um, but about a year is probably uh, a, a relatively common size for a waterfall project, uh, apart from the most trivial ones. Once we know the expected delivery date and how many people are on it, we can therefore give an expected cost. And then we can hand over uh, our plan to the customer. And plans are often like this, they're a Gantt chart showing all the different tasks and how they're related and what the dependencies are between them. 
but that isn't a typical project plan. That's a little fraction of a typical project plan. So often the massive document, uh, you know, going out into the future with you know thousands and thousands of tasks allocated to individual people. Yeah. So let's move on. What, what about the next phases? The architecture and design. What's the purpose of them? So we have a software architect typically and a set of developers. They design some software that's going to meet the functional requirements. Um, they'll typically write a design document because they have to uh, have that signed off. Um, it's analogous to uh, an architect's drawings, for example. You know, it gives a, you know, a, a both diagram diagrammatic uh, view of what needs to be built and uh, typically a bunch of pros about you know, how it's going to be built, you know, what practices and uh, design patterns they're going to use, etc. Uh, the important thing is it tells the individual developers how they're going to build the software, what constraints are, etc. Following that, we get onto the actual build phase. The developers take the uh, specification and the design docs uh, and they build the software that's been specified. Often, they have no contact with the customer. Their relationship is with the business analyst, perhaps, the architect, uh, but day to day, they don't get to speak to the customer because, well, why would they? Everything they need to do is written down in these uh, functional specification and design docs. Right, so after so many months of writing the software, they hand it over to Quality Assurance. A bunch of testers will take the completed software and then run it through some test scenarios to check that it actually meets the original requirements that were written down in the functional specification. Uh, and of course, any complex system never quite meets the requirements. It's always very difficult. It's, uh, you know, software development isn't easy. So there are bugs which will get returned to the developers. It will fix them, hopefully, turn them back into quality assurance. Uh, and then we have a cycle of working through testing, fixing bugs, until uh, the uh, quality of the software is acceptable. That's the, the idea. And then once we've done that, we can deliver it to the customer. Uh, and the customer you know, checks that it does what they wanted, make sure they're happy, uh, and then they can implement the software and start getting a return on the investment that they've spent building that software. So, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, I mean, it can work. Uh, you know, if it's a simple system or straightforward requirements, you know, you, you can do that. Uh, most importantly, it is much more successful than having no methodology at all. Uh, you know, so in the 80s and 90s, when you're competing with, or oh, let's just make it up as we go along, waterfall development uh, worked really well for that. It was much, much better. There was still the level of problems that we're talking about today, um, but it was significantly better than it used to be. And when I talk later, there's also another reason why it seemed to work quite well in the 80s and 90s, uh, but I'll get onto that when we talk about agile requirements. However, we can make a bunch of improvements. So, let's look at uh, you know, what we're doing to mature the industry through the use of uh, agile methodologies. So, the first thing we want to do is let's actually recognise that software is not the same as physical engineering. So that process, the waterfall process, works really well if you're building a bridge. You, know, you can't build a roadway until you've built the foundations. You can't uh, change the foundations after you've started building a roadway. In the software, it's much more amenable to, to change. Uh, we can you know, decide to replace the underlying uh, system uh, while leaving the uh, actual functionality there, for example. Uh, we don't need to deliver it all in one go. There's no point in delivering a, a bridge until you've finished it. But software, you can deliver it uh, as you improve the system uh, from the beginning. You can get instant feedback. Customers can see what you've already built so far and say, yes, 
that is uh, exactly what I'm asked for. Uh, I know you haven't built the rest yet, but the bit you have built so far looks like what we need. Or they can say, you know what, you've misunderstood what I said or what I wanted. Um, I think we need to change that. And you can go ahead and make those changes at that point before you build the rest of it. And every project is different. Now, every engineering project is also different, but I think there's a degree of um, you know, or, or order of magnitude difference between you know, the difference between all the different types of software that people build uh, and the different types of engineering projects. You know, a bridge typically has very many uh, you know, common uh, commonalities between it and the previous bridge they built. Now, sometimes in engineering, we do go out uh, and build something completely unique. Uh, and in those cases, you sometimes see the actual problems we see with software in those engineering projects. They take longer than you expected, they go over budget, etc. So, you know, it's uh, not just a problem with software, it can affect uh, other people. But with software, we have the advantage that you know, we don't have to follow that rigid process. So, we've realised this, and then, you know, a decade or so ago, uh, we came out with uh, the Agile methodology. Um, and there are some core underlying principles that we use for this, which we call the Agile Manifesto. And first of those is that we value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We think people uh, you know, talking to each other and interacting with each other is much more important than setting down and deciding what tools we're going to use, etc. We think that working software is much more important uh, than comprehensive documentation. If you're a document, you can't be earning a return on investment on that document. Uh, if you've got working software, it actually can do some business for you. We want customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Uh, if you're ever uh, in a situation where you're having to refer back to your contract, something is seriously going wrong with the project. So we want to collaborate with our customers. And we want to respond to change over just following a plan. We know that businesses change. It's uh, something that impacts everybody. You know, we had the financial crash a few years ago. That made a big impact and change on many businesses, etc. We have to be able to adapt to those changes uh, rather than just sticking with what we were doing before. So, instead of waterfall, we go for incremental and iterative development. So what does this mean? Well, we decide to break things down and do them uh, in small incremental steps and deliver iteratively over time. So, We'll take a small piece of the functionality that we want to deliver, we'll do the specification, we'll do enough architecture uh, to uh, support what we need to build, we'll do a little bit of design to support just that small set of requirements, we'll build it and we'll test it, and we'll deliver it. Now, at that point, it's not a working system, but it's working software. We've shown through that first iteration that we can deliver some working software. It doesn't do anything probably useful for the customer yet, but it's uh, it, it's gone through all of those processes. You know, and we highlight that with the red dot to say it's not sufficient yet for the customer to use to start returning uh, on getting a return on their investment. And then we do it again and again. And each step, we're getting more and more of the functionality the customer wants. We're still not there, but you know we're. We've proved that we've got a process, and we've proved that we're delivering working software at this point. It's nearly there. You know, we've nearly got enough for them to roll it out and start earning some, uh, some money from their investment. And then maybe at some point, perhaps halfway through the project, quarter, three quarters, you've got enough that they can actually start using the software and start earning some money. And you can continue. And you keep delivering in iterations until you get to the end. So, let's look at how that works in an agile, iterative 
environment. And let's start with the differences about capital requirements. So previously, we talked about you capture requirements all up front. Of course, the question is, you know, when did you say I'll get this? You know, the, the business analyst will talk to the customer and say, well, what, what do you need? Uh, oh, by the way, our, our project plan says we'll deliver it to you in a year's time. Um, well, most customers don't actually know exactly what they need. They might have a, a broad view of the sort of things they need to know. They might have an idea of what their top priorities are over the next few weeks, but they don't know, uh, you know what's, uh, what's needed in a year's time. Um, they don't know what's going to change in the next year. Will there be another recession? What will that do to the business? Will there be a new entrant in, into the market which uh, disrupts uh, their whole uh, business model and they have to adapt and change to that? Uh, so, when faced with this question, a customer is going to say, well, I don't know really, but here are all the things that I think I need to do. Here are all the things that I might need to do. They ask for everything that they can possibly need because they've got a year until they wait for it. And if they forget to ask for something, because we're working on a yearly cycle, uh, it could be two years until they get something that they forget to ask for. So of course, they have to ask for everything. And what does that mean? Well, it means you end up building more than you need because you ask, you're going to build everything that they could possibly want rather than what they actually need, etc. So, why is that a problem? Well, well, we can see why that's a problem, but uh, you know, if we think about uh, having to wait a year, what does that mean to what their requirements are? Well, the industry has, has looked at this, and there's this concept called the half-life of a requirement, or a set of requirements. So, day one, we'll capture all the requirements that the customer says they want. In a period of time afterwards, actually only half of those are still relevant because of the way that the business environment has changed, or legislation has changed, or they want to change the way they do their own business. And after the next period of time, it's then only a quarter, and then only an eighth. Now, in the 80s, uh, they think about you know, a decade was about the half-life of a requirement then. So if you've got a year-long project, actually, by the end of that year, pretty much all the requirements you got at the very beginning were still relevant at the end. So actually the project you're delivering using waterfall methodology would be fine, pretty much. There'd be some things that change, but probably not much. Uh, there was some research done um, recently, uh, it's in a paper by, uh, uh, from the UK government called System Error. Uh, they think now, certainly for governmental type projects, the half-life of their requirements is six months. So, if it's only six months, that means after a year, it takes a year to deliver your waterfall project. Only a quarter of what you've actually asked for is still relevant. And you've spent time building three quarters that is no longer relevant. That's one of the reasons that software projects fail now, whereas perhaps the waterfall methodology was more acceptable in the past. So, what's, what's the solution to this? Well, incremental requirements. We uh, capture just enough requirements every iteration to deliver what we need to do in that iteration. So, we get a rough overall view of the requirements, that doesn't take very long, and we can then break them down into what we call stories. Uh, they're you know, a small piece of functionality that's small enough to deliver in a very quick time, you know, typically a few days or a week or so. Um, but the important thing is they deliver a bit of business value. We only try to deliver things which actually have business value, things that the customer is really going to see tangible benefit from. Sometimes we can't do that, we have to do other things, but we're tracking requirements in terms of what actually meets customers' requirements for business value. Um, we don't write a huge amount of documentation. 
really the uh, story is, is what's considered a placeholder for a conversation. If we ask business analysts to spend days, weeks, writing down all of the requirements on a bit of paper, well, as we've seen from the half-life discussion, actually that document is going to be out of date pretty quickly. There isn't much point in it. What you actually want to do is talk to people. You want your developers, your business analysts, your testers, and the customer having a conversation, explaining what they actually want, what they need. Um, and you use the card purely as a, as a placeholder, as something to track what you're doing. So once we've got our sort of high-level view of our requirements, we've created uh, our set of stories, uh, we uh, create a card wall, typically. Uh, each card represents one of those stories. And we order them in uh, priority here from left to right. Oh, that hasn't come out very well. There we go. Little hand there. Um, so, most important requirements at this end, least important requirements, as far as the customer is concerned, at the other end. They're in charge of working out that, that order. That way they get to choose what is most important to you. And then once we've got that rough outline, oh, uh, we start work. So they're all supposed to be green there, <laughs> those top two. Uh, we start work on the most important stories. The business analyst starts doing their, their uh, analysis of, of, of what's required for those stories. They talk to the customer, they talk to the developers, everybody gets together and makes sure they understand what's, what's actually required. Uh, and as we go through time, we just go down this, what we call the backlog of stories, elaborating each one and then delivering it. We don't bother spending time on the lower priority items when we can concentrate on the things at the beginning that are most important. And then, rather than having that uh, uh, plan with a million tasks on it, which if you want to change the ordering of things uh, is very time consuming, often you'll find project managers uh, spending all of their time, literally, wrangling the project document uh, to rearrange tasks rather than actually managing the project. So what can we do? Well, replanning and change is really easy in this approach. We can say, oh, well, we've got a new requirement X come in. That's very really important. We'll put it in the next iteration that we're going to deliver. Maybe you know, there's some new legislation which we have to get a change for as soon as possible. And as a consequence of that, maybe we say, well, actually, G is a lot less important. We'll move that back a couple of weeks. K is, uh, is required more urgently than G, so we'll now move that up. Planning and change is much easier to do when you can just move things around without having to worry about well, what are, uh, you know, who's going to do what, when, you know, etc. So, what are the consequences of this? Well, we need to work with the customer more closely. Um, analysts, developers, and testers, they all need to be working with the customer. Uh, Customer needs to be involved throughout the project, so uh, yeah, there's no use just spending you know, a couple of months at the very beginning of the project, talking to the customer, getting all the information out of their heads and then throwing the requirements over the wall. Um, customer needs to be involved all the way through. Now that is sometimes a challenge uh, for, for organisations who have only worked in the um, uh, waterfall uh, process. Um, Another consequence is oh, that the development team needs to be close to the customer because they need to be spending uh, time talking to them. Uh, and often India and China aren't close enough because of the time differences. You can use modern technologies, uh, you know, like video conferencing, etc., to, to form a virtual team. But if you've got you know, different time zones, it becomes much more difficult to have people available all the time to talk to you. you know, if you're only working in the morning UK time because you're based in India, um, and you need to speak to uh, the customer's representative 
uh, at the start of your day, well, you have to wait four or five hours. What's a delay in the project? Or you make a, your own mind up about what's going on, and then you may have to go back and fix it. So uh, that doesn't always work. Oh, one more now. These slides are very bizarre. Right. So now we have our stories. Uh, how do we work out how long the project takes? Well, we have to go through estimating. So, this is uh, going backwards. Okay. Right. So we need to do estimating. The problem is people are really bad at doing absolute estimating. We're rubbish at it. Uh, so, similar research laboratory did a study uh, in 2006 um, where they uh, got people together to do estimating in groups. So, they first one, first exercise, they gave uh, one specification on A4 to uh, one team. The same specification, but in a bigger font with more line spacing over a couple of pages to another team and they repeated this a few times, uh, and it turned out that the bigger the text or the more pages you had, the higher your estimate by 48%. So precisely the same requirements, but presented in a different way, uh, caused problems. Next. Oh, well, extra requirements. So they gave one group four requirements, they gave another group those same four plus another one, and then a third group, the five requirements, but said, forget about requirement five. You don't need to do that, just estimate requirements one to four. And what happened? Well, the first two groups with the two different sets of requirements both came out about the same, and the team who were told to ignore one requirement actually came out 100% higher. So, yeah. Uh, then, irrelevant information. They gave the same specification to, to both teams, and then uh, a bunch of uh, irrelevant extra information. So it was things like, uh, what other software is installed on the user's desktop? Things that wouldn't affect the estimate you were going to produce. And, well, again, if you got the extra information, they came out 95% higher than people just doing the same, estimating the same size of the project. And finally, the concept of anchoring. So this was where it was the same specification. One team was just given the specification and told to estimate it. Second team were told, oh, here's the specification. Now, the customer, who knows nothing about software development, has no clue about you know, how much effort this really is, thinks it's about 50 days effort. And then the third team, same specification, we're told, customer, who knows nothing about software development, etc., uh, thinks it's about a thousand days. And when they uh, looked at this, uh, the team who were told, oh, it's tiny, it's only 50 days, actually came in 80% smaller than the team who had no anchoring at all. Uh, because they thought, well, you know, he might not know about software, but you know, he must know something, so perhaps uh, you know, it's much easier than we think it is. And similarly, the team who uh, uh, were told, oh no, it's massive, you know, they said, well, he obviously knows something we don't know, so perhaps uh, it's, uh, it's bigger. So they added about 20%. So what does this tell us? This basically just tells us that we are rubbish at estimating. So if you sit down and, and actually try and come up with a fixed number for how long it's going to take to do a piece of work, you're going to be wrong. So, what are alternatives? Well, let's let's estimate. Oh, uh, well, this is very hard. Your right. So, how many fluid ounces or milliliters is in that glass of beer? Something we all know about. So. Uh, Hopefully we can uh, uh, work it out. Anyone want to give a guess? 400 milliliters. 400 milliliters? 568 milliliters. 568? 473. 
Yeah, okay. So a nice wide range there. Um, you know, you don't know uh, how big that glass is, you know. Uh, now, the second glass, though, how much has it got in compared with the first one? About half as much. We're actually pretty good at working out how uh, how big things are compared to other things. Now that could be a half pint glass or a pint glass, but we know that uh, you know this one has got about half as much beer in as the first one. We're pretty good at that. We can tell relative sizes quite well. So what do we do? Well, we estimate in uh, relative proportions. One way of doing that is to use t-shirt sized estimates. So what we say is, we've got our set of stories, let's just say, you know, well, that's a small one, that's medium, that's large, medium, small, extra large, extra small, and we just categorise all the stories based on our thinking of how relative to each other how, how sized they are. So we have a list of <coughs> stories, uh, A to O in this case, all allocated to size. And then we do an initial calibration. We take a representative sample um, and based on our experience we will do a, a detailed estimate to try and uh, view how big say a large is compared to a medium. So, you know, a large in this case is say eight days effort and a medium is five days effort is our is our view. Um, but we don't think in terms of actual effort from the, after this point. We're saying a large is eight points and a medium is five points, etc. So we tie that into our plan, you know, so uh, A was a small, I think, so three units, three points, B was a medium, and so on. And that can then give us how long, how much effort we think is required to deliver the project, if our initial calibration is correct. There we go. So, we know how long we've got, we know how many points we need to deliver, and we can produce a graph saying, well, based on our uh, you know, estimation, uh, we've got an expected velocity of this much, of this slope of graph. We'll deliver then if our numbers are right, but we know they probably won't be, and we can deliver all of the requirements up the side. But because we know uh, that actually our estimates are probably wrong, they're probably in a range, hopefully around about the point, you know, on average of where we've estimated. Uh, we could go faster if we've overestimated everything, or we could go slower if we've underestimated everything, giving us a sort of cone of, uh, uh, you know, of delivery, which means we think we'll deliver between our best delivery date and our worst delivery date. Hopefully delivering you know, at our expected point. Between year two? Yeah. So it is fifty percent over. Well, you know, so you know, this is just a quick graph. Uh, you know, so I like can fit the words on as well. <laughs> so, you know, we, we don't necessarily know where our best our best velocity could be. I mean it could be even better. Uh, we don't know what our worst velocity is, it could be even worse. Uh, but to give an idea, you know, we can say to the customer, well we think you know, if everything goes better than planned we could probably, better than expected, we could probably deliver here. If things, if everything stacks up against us, we think we'll be able to deliver by the worst date. We might not, but you know, the whole point is we'll be delivering in iterations and we'll be able to track it, as we'll talk about shortly. But that's not the only thing. Because we're doing it iteratively, um, rather than all together at once, Actually, at some point, we get to the point where the customer has enough working software that they can start using it, which is called the minimal viable product. So, 
if in fact we are slower than we'd expected, they will still get a working system which is minimal requirements delivered by that date. They don't have to wait right until the end uh, to deliver everything to be able to start actually getting a return on their investment. And because we're delivering uh, iteratively, they can decide to stop the project at any point um, where they've got enough of the system to actually uh, deliver the value that, they've, that they're looking for. So that was the estimating and how that can plan into uh, you know, your estimated delivery dates. So let's look at building the software. So with the software build, the issue in the waterfall model is actually they don't actually get to use the software until you deliver right at the end, which means they get no value until right at the end. After the specification stage, they've got a pile of documents. They can't use that to earn themselves any return on their investment. Or at least, you know, it's so minimal that there's, there's no point. They might have learned something more about their business than perhaps they knew before, but they haven't got a working system that they can start using to solve the problems that they've actually, you know, wanted to solve with this system. Similarly, when you're halfway through the build, you've got a bunch of half-built software. You've started work probably on everything throughout the system, maybe not quite, but you know, it's not yet working as a whole. And specifically, it's not being tested to prove that it actually meets your requirements. You only get that at the very end. And so one of the um, uh, you know, famous quotes is, well, the first 9% of the code accounts for the first 9% of the development time, The remaining 10% of the code accounts for the other 90% of development time. So let's see what, what actually happens with a waterfall project. So I've compressed the uh, timeline a bit here. So this is the anticipated delivery date. We work through, we get into the build, and uh, uh, it overruns, it overruns. We squeeze uh, the uh, testing and we fail to deliver because it's not ready. So we go back, we give bugs back to the development team, they spend time fixing that, goes into some more QA cycle and we fail to deliver again. And again. And then eventually you know, we've slipped, we've gone through these, all these cycles, and at last we deliver something. It might be very buggy, but, you know, it's just got over that bar of acceptability. Um, or, you've got to the end and you go, well, we've run out of money, we haven't actually been able to deliver it, we're going to have to scrap the project. Ooh, obviously a problem. So, what, uh, what does this mean? Well, you have the question, uh, when you come to the end of build, how many bugs are, are there in the whole system? Well, we only find that out when we start uh, testing. Um, how long will the testing take? Well, we don't know, because we don't know what the quality of the build is. You know, is it, maybe the development team have introduced lots of bugs. Maybe they've, been a, uh, they've done really well and there are very few bugs and the testing won't take very long. But you don't know, because you have no metrics, because you've done no testing yet. Uh, and you might have uh, uh, done everything correctly to the specification, but of course the customer might turn around and say, well, that's not what I meant. Everywhere where you've put a blue button, I went to the green one. Uh, I know I said blue at the beginning, but I meant green. Sorry. Can you go and fix that? Of course, you then have to go and fix all of those different blue buttons and turn them green. It's a trite example, but I think you get the idea. Um, and as we've also talked about, testing will often get squeezed. They'll have a fixed delivery date that they want to hit, because that's what they've committed to in their high-level project plan that they keep giving people every week. Um, but as build slips, because they haven't quite managed to deliver what they said they'll deliver, 
um, because their estimates were too aggressive, for example, um, they will often squeeze the testing portion. Um, and of course, by testing it less, you don't find all the bugs, you might release software, and then all your customers find those bugs for you, and you realise you've got a rubbish piece of software. And finally, typically you'll do a lessons learned at the very end of the project, but of course since you're disbanding your project team after having delivered, they won't actually apply those, so you've got a problem there. They might apply them on the next project, but that doesn't help the one you've just finished. So the solution is uh, doing your testing every iteration. You can quickly find out how many bugs are in each iteration's uh, software. And we say, story isn't complete until it's fully tested and the customer is happy, i.e. it's working, it's fully tested and working um, and you know we can deliver that and start using it potentially. Uh, so what does this mean? Well it allows um, adjustments uh, to priorities in the plan. If it turns out that actually you've underestimated everything and it's taking longer you can say, well, okay, based on that, we're not going to be able to deliver the lower priority items down the line. Actually, let's just concentrate on the important ones that we know. We've underestimated them, but we can deliver them still within the timescale. You don't spend time uh, building a little bit of everything and slowly incrementing it and then having to test everything. You only need to test what you've built. And if you're running slow, you keep going on the most important items until they're working. And of course you can uh, fix any of those misunderstandings early on. The first time they see that blue button, they can turn it green. And then every time you write something after that, you'll make it green to start off with. So you spend less time in remedial actions. So you spend more time getting the most important things right first. And what does this mean? How do we track progress then? Well, as we go along, we're delivering actual functionality. Each iteration, we can see what we've delivered up the list of functionality. And we can see where we are compared to our original track. And we can project out where we think you know, our actual delivery date will be. In this case, we're running a little bit behind our original estimates. But the customer can see this, and they've seen this is all working software. And because the minimal viable product was somewhere around here, they could probably say, well, you know, we can release that now, uh, and anything else we do, well, that's just extra benefit. So, what are the uh, financial consequences? Oh. I don't know what's going on with the slides. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the big important question You've got to this point of your software delivery, how much more will this project cost? The problem is you don't know. If the estimates are wrong, you've sunk up you know, a lot of costs so far, but you still haven't got anything. You haven't yet been able to deliver it, uh, and you have to make some tough decisions. So do we continue to spend more on this project? Or uh, do we write off what we've already spent? It's a very tough decision, you don't know. So, solution, back to iterative and incremental. Uh, if the estimates are wrong, well you've delivered working software every iteration. The customer has at least something of value. It may not yet meet their minimal viable product, it may not meet their total requirement, but they can see something of value and it gives them the confidence to understand how much more money they will need to spend to get either to their minimal viable product or to some other level of functionality that they're happy with. Or to change their requirements and, uh, and adjust what they need to do so that they can get what they need within the budget that they actually have. Or decide to spend more budget um, as they uh, if they think, well, you know, we do need what we want, uh, what we originally said, it's going to cost us more, but we can see the progress we're making, we actually have working software which you're showing is working, 
were happy to invest the extra X thousand pounds to get what we need. So, in summary, software industry, it's still young, it is maturing, uh, starting from that uh, small scale craft uh, industry to engineering discipline, uh, sort of mirroring the uh, physical engineering, and now into agile software development. And Agile, we focus on the people, we focus on working software, collaboration, and on handling change. With literary delivery, the important thing is we always have something of value every iteration. The customer can see what they are getting, they can plan for what they're getting based on how much progress you're making and they can stop at any point and still have something of value. It gives you much better tracking of progress and much better management of budget. Thank you.